In this video, you will learn about the graphs of polynomial functions of higher degree. So what we're looking at is how to graph things such as x cubed, x to the fourth power, x to the fifth power, and etc. And we're looking at the characteristics of these graphs. All right, so let's first begin by talking about the far left and the far right behavior. So the far left and the far right of each graph is going to do something a little bit different. So in general, let's say we have a polynomial, we'll call it p of x. And then we have our coefficients, where we have a sub n, a sub n minus 1, etc., all the way to the end, where we have our constant term. And then we have our variable component, x to some power, and then x to uh, the next degree, less than that. So if this were like fourth power, the next one would be x to the third power, and then second power, first power, and then constant. So if this is our polynomial in general, there are some things that we can determine just by looking at the coefficient of the leading term. So if you look at the leading term right here, so the first term, the term with highest degree, if you look just at this, and specifically the coefficient and exponent, we can determine what the left and the right side of the graph is going to do. So here in this table, we have what's going to happen. So let's explain what we have here. So first off, if n is even, and that's this column right here. If n is even, so say it's like something to the second power, fourth power, sixth power, etc. What we know is that the far left and the far right will be doing the same thing. Either it's both going up or it's both going down. So how do you know if it's going up or going down? Well, we know that based off the coefficient. So if a sub n, the first, uh, the, the leading coefficient, if that is bigger than zero, meaning it's positive. If it's positive, it's facing upwards. If it's negative, so if it's less than zero, as we see right here, then they're both going down. The far left and far right are going down. Now if n is odd, so say we have something to the third power or fifth power or seventh power, etc what we know is that the far left and the far right are doing opposite things. So it's doing opposite things, but if the coefficient is positive, if it's bigger than zero, what we know is that the far left is going down and the far right is going up. Whereas if the leading coefficient is negative, if it's less than zero, it is going up to the far left and then down to the far right. So we can use this little table here to figure out the far left and far right behavior of any graph. Let's take a look at a couple examples. Here we have function p of x, and we're told that p of x is 5x squared minus 3x plus 23. All right, first off, this leading term right here has a degree that is even. So it's to the second power. So with that being said, we know the far left and far right will be doing the same thing, either both going up or both going down. Well, because the 5 is positive, we know that they're both going up. So it's going up to the left and up to the right. And what that will look like here with a second degree polynomial is we know that is going to be a parabola, where the far left is going up and the far right is going up. Now what if you had a polynomial like this, where we have negative 4x cubed minus x squared plus x plus 3? Well here, this uh, leading coefficient, or leading term, has an exponent that is odd, is to the third power. So what we know is that the far left and the far right are doing opposite things. And because the leading coefficient is negative, what we know is the far left is going up and the far right is going down. So this graph, what it's going to look like is it's going to look something like this. And how do we know it's going to look something like that? Well, we know the far left is going up, far right is going down. But here, okay, notice this exponent is a third power. So whatever the exponent is, we can have at most one less than that number of turns in the graph. So here, 
uh, we can have at most two different change in, changes in directions of the graph. So we see it changes direction right here, starts going back up, then it changes direction again right here, and goes back down. So it's changing direction twice. So that's how we know it's going to look something like that. It's going to go down, then up, then back down again. Whereas here with the second power um, term, the polynomial is a second degree, we can have at most one turn or one change in direction. We see that happening here. It goes down, and then right here at this vertex, at this point, it starts going back up. It changes direction one time. Let's try another example. Here we have p of x equals negative 3x to the fourth power plus 5x plus 2. All right, so we can determine the far left and far right behavior by looking at this leading term. So this leading term, the one in the front with the largest degree, we see that the exponent is an even power. So what that means, because it's an even exponent, is that the far left and the far right are doing the same thing. Either it's both going up or both going down. Well, because it is a negative coefficient in the front of that term, we know that both the far left and the far right are going down. All right, so we know that. And with this degree of 4, we know that this graph is going to have at most three changes in direction. So in general, um, when you have a fourth power, it's going to look something like this. So it's going to go up. So the far left is going down. So it goes up, changes direction once, goes back up to change direction a second time, then goes back down again, changing direction three different times, here, here, and here. Now it doesn't have to change direction three times like that, but it can at most change directions three times like that. And it doesn't have to be symmetric either. So sometimes like this could go way up and back down like that instead of being at the same level as this other one. Uh, and then here it could go way down like this. So we'd have to find a few more points to figure out how high up and how far down is it going. But in general, it's going to look something like that. And then here with this example, we have p of x equals 5x to the fifth power plus 7x to the fourth power minus 3x squared plus 6. Now to determine the far left and far right behavior, we take this leading term, which by the way, if it's not arranged in descending order, you want to arrange it in that manner. So the leading term will always be the term of largest degree. So we look at the this uh, term right here, and that's your leading term. The exponent is an odd number. So what that means is because it's odd is that the far left and far right are doing opposite things. And we know that because the coefficient is a positive number, that the far left is going down and the far right is going up. And we also know that because the exponent is a 5, we can have at most four different changes in direction in the graph. So if the far left is going down, it's going to look something like that. So it's going to start like that. Then it's going to go up. It can change direction one time, two times, three times, and four times. And the far right, we know it's going up like this. So we have at most four different changes in direction. It doesn't have to be. It could be three or two. Um, but in general, many times it's going to look like this. And again, we don't know how high up and how far down each of these different peaks and troughs are going. Uh, but it's going to look many times something like this. And regardless, the far left is going down. We know the far right is going to be going up like this. Now before moving on, let's take a look at these graphs that we have right here. Because what I want to point out to you is a term, or two terms that we have, and that is relative maximum and relative minimum points. So with these graphs, we see that it goes forever in both directions. Uh, so like this first one right here, this parabola, we see it's going forever to the left and forever up to the right. But we have this point right here that is a minimum point. So we can call this a relative minimum point. 
All right, and then same thing for these other graphs. So like right here, this would be another relative minimum. Uh, this is another relative minimum. This is another relative minimum. This is another relative minimum. And it's called a relative minimum because if you take a look at this graph right here, this third one, mm -hmm. um, notice that it keeps going down forever like this. So this point, or the, both these points, are not the actual minimum point because it does keep going below that forever. But uh, it's a relative minimum because within a certain region, so if you look just from here to here, for example, okay, those are the relative minimum points. So within that region, those are the, the lowest points. And then same idea for the maximum points. So if you take a look right here on this graph, that is a relative maximum point. And the reason is because that is the highest point within a certain region. So yes, it does keep going forever up like this, but if you look just within a certain region, like here, that is the maximum point within that region. Same thing with these other graphs. This is a relative maximum point. This is another relative maximum point. Here is one, and then here is another one. So again, we put the word relative in front because it's not truly the absolute maximum or minimum point, uh, but it's um, within a certain region, it is the maximum or minimum point. Now, on the topic of maximum and minimum points, let's take a look at an application problem. Here we are told that a sheet of cardboard, three feet by four feet, will be made into a box by cutting equal size squares from each corner and folding up the four edges what will be the dimensions of the box with the largest volume. And here is a picture of what we're talking about. So three is the length all the way across, or it's the width, I guess, all the way up here. And then four, that is the length all the way across down here. And then see this little section from here to here, that part? That is being folded upwards. So all the way around is being folded up. So because it's being folded up, x is going to be the height of the box. Um, and then, let's write this down, x is the height. And then because of that, when you fold it up, the length now is we take the 4, but we have to subtract x here and subtract x over here because we're folding it upwards. So now the length from here to here, which is the actual length of the box, is 4 minus x minus another x, which is 4 minus 2x. So 4 minus 2x is going to be the length. And then same concept for the width, looking here at the 3. When you fold up, we are folding up by x here and x over here, which means we're taking away uh, two x's from the width. So the width would be 3 minus 2x. So the width is 3 minus 2x. All right, and then we can use our volume formula for a rectangular prism. Volume is found by taking length times width times height. So you multiply x times 4 minus 2x times 3 minus 2x, and that's going to give you the volume. So if we distribute x to the 3 and the negative 2x, that would give you 3x minus 2x squared. And then we can FOIL, so we can multiply 3x by 4 to get 12x. 3x times negative 2x is negative 6x. Negative 2x squared times 4 is negative 8x squared. And negative 2x squared times negative 2x is positive 4x cubed. So we can combine like terms. We have volume equals, put the 4x cubed first. And then we have um, minus 8x squared. So minus 8x squared. And sorry, actually, um, 3x times negative 2x is negative 6x squared. So negative 6x squared minus 8x squared. And that gives you negative 14x squared. And then we have plus the 12x. So this is your function. Volume equals 4x cubed minus 14x squared plus 12x. So we have found our function. And what we can do is we can use a graphing utility to figure out the, the graph of this polynomial. So here we chose to use this website. It's called Desmos, and you can use different 
um, websites or use a calculator or whatever. But what we want is we want to type in our equation and we see it over here. So you type it in and when you do that, you're gonna get your graph. So looking at the graph, we can determine by looking at the relative maximum point, we can determine the dimensions that we want for the box. So notice right here, this is your peak. That is your relative, min or relative maximum point. All right, so that's the point we want. So X is 0.566. So that means we folded the box in 0.566, uh, I believe it was inches, on every side. And that gave you the maximum volume, which was 3.032. Now you might be wondering, well, why would it not be something over here where the volume is greater? Well, in the context of the problem, that would not make sense because the width was three inches. And if you're folding in on both sides, the most that you can fold in would be 1.5 inches, right? So if you're folding on both sides, it's gonna be at most half of the width. All right, and that's what we see here. Here at 1.5, that's a zero of this function. Anything bigger than 1.5, for a while it's gonna be negative. And in the context of the problem, anything past two, like over here, doesn't make sense because you're folding in more than possible. So this function, in the context of the problem, we want to look at the relative maximum point, which is right here. So we know that we want to fold in the box by 0.566 inches to produce a volume, which is 3.032 uh, cubic inches. And actually, sorry, the units were feet. So everything is in feet. All right, so that was uh, point five six six feet and three point zero three two cubic feet for the volume now the next concept we want to discuss is called the intermediate value theorem and what this says is that if p is a polynomial function and p of a is not equal to p of b for a and b then p takes on every value between p of a and p of b in the interval from a to b now what does that even mean well, let's say we had a graph, and here we have, let's say, something like this. Well, here this part says, first of all, that if P A is not equal to P of B, so let's say we pick uh, this point right here and this point right here. All right, so that point, the first one we'll call, um, We'll, we'll call it a for x, our x value, and then p of a is our y value. Down here, this point, we'll have b for the x value, and then p of b for the y value. So we notice that p of a is not equal to p of b. The y values are different, right? So the first part is true for a and b, right? These two different x values. Then what this uh, theorem says is that our function, p, takes on every value between P of A and P of B. So it takes on every value within the interval from A to B. So what that means is that from here to here, so with our X values from between here and here, within that interval, we know that our function will have a curve or some sort of um, connection between those two different points. All right, and that's basically all it says, is that if you, have a, if you have a function where P of A and P of B are not the same, so the Y values are different, we know that uh, it's connected between or within every point between there. So it's not gonna like jump, all right? It's gonna be connected. So what this is useful for is if P of A, let's say is a positive number, so let's call that uh, positive three. And let's say P of B, this Y value, let's say that's negative two, some negative number. Well, if the signs are different, one's positive, one's negative, what we know is that at some point it's gotta cross over this X axis. So if the signs are different, we know that there must be an X intercept in between those. And we, so we can use that to find potential intercepts. We can find different zeros of the function if we know P of A and P of B are opposite signs. One's positive, one's negative. 
So let's try an example of using the intermediate value theorem. Let's say here we want to show that f of x equals x cubed plus x minus 1 has a real 0 on the interval between 0 and 1. So these are your x values, 0 and 1. All right, so what we do is we figure out the y values associated with those x values. So for x, we know uh, x is 0. We're trying to find y for that one point. And then for this one, when x is 1, we're trying to find the y value for that. So we're going to plug in a 0 for x and see what we get. We have 0 cubed plus 0 minus 1, which would give you negative 1. So when x is 0, y is negative 1. Over here, uh, trying to find the y value for this point, you plug a 1 in for x to get 1 cubed plus 1 minus 1. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. So f of 1 equals positive 1. So what we have here are y values that have different signs. One's positive, one's negative. And it doesn't need to be uh, like positive 1, negative 1. It could be like negative 1 and positive 4 for this to be true. But just the fact that they have different signs means that there must be a 0 in between 0 and 1. Right? So if you think of the, the graph of this, um, 0, negative 1 is over here. Uh, sorry, down here. That point would be right here. And then 1, 1 is over 1, up 1 right here. And this is a curve, right? So you know it's got to be connected like this with the curve. So that means there's got to be an an um, x-intercept somewhere in between 0 and 1 just by the fact that these y values are opposite signs. So our end goal is we want to try to use all this information to be able to sketch a graph. Alright, so the intermediate value theorem can help us find an intercept, find a point on the graph. And here what we have is an even and odd power of x minus c theorem. And this can be used as well to help us with the graphing. So what this says is that if p is a polynomial function and c is a real number, and if x minus c is a factor of p exactly k times, then the graph of p will do the following. So if k is an even positive integer, so like something to the second power or fourth power or sixth power, what we know is that it's not going to cross the x-axis at that point. Whereas if your exponent is an odd, uh, an odd number, what we know is that it will cross the x-axis at that point. So an even power will not cross, it'll just touch at that point, whereas an odd exponent for an x minus c factor would be crossing at that point. So what does that look like with an actual example? Well, here we are trying to figure out if we have this polynomial p of x equals x minus 3 times x plus 2 squared times x minus 6 cubed. We're trying to figure out where will the graph of this polynomial cross the x-axis and where will it only touch or intersect the x-axis? Well, here, okay, this x minus 3 is only to the first power. So what that means is that it will cross over at that point. So the point that we get from this is going to be um, x equals 3. So if you plug a 3 in, that's going to create a 0 right there. It's going to create a 0 of the function. So at that point, 3, 0, it's going to cross over. And we know that because the exponent is an odd number. And over here, x minus 6 to the third power, the exponent as well is an odd power. So the 0 that we get from this, which would be the point 6, 0, that will cross over at that point. Whereas over here, the x plus 2 has an even power. So the x plus 2 will only touch at the point of negative 2, 0. So it's going to touch, but it's not going to cross over at that point. So now, putting everything together. We learn about the far left and far right behavior. We learn about the relative maximum and minimum points. Uh, we learn how to interpret the even and odd power theorem. All right, so putting this all together, we can now try to sketch different graphs of polynomials. So here's kind of a procedure with which we can follow 
to determine a sketch for a graph. So the first thing we want to do is figure out the far left and far right behavior. And then from there, we can kind of get an idea of what it's going to look like, the shape at least. And we did that previously in this lesson. But we need to have some, some specific points to put on the graph as well. So to find some specific points, we can find the y-intercept. We can also find the x-intercepts. And we can also find additional points. So if you have your x-intercepts, we can find additional points in between those. And we could also check for symmetry. So like checking to see if it's symmetric about the x-axis or y-axis or about the origin, which typically um, that, that may sometimes be helpful, but uh, many times you'll find that it's not symmetric. So you can almost kind of skip that many times, but that is something else we could do. And then from there, we can finally sketch the graph. So let's try an example here. What if we had this function, f of x equals x to the fourth power minus 3x cubed? So if you're told to graph this, first thing is we can figure out the far left and far right behavior. So look here at the leading term. We have an even power. So what that means is that the far left and the far right are going to be doing the same thing, either both going up or both going down. Well, because the leading coefficient is a positive number, it's positive 1, we know that the far left and, and the far right are both going to be going up. So we know it's going up. We know that with a degree of 4, that it can take at most three different changes in direction. So one uh, typical way of drawing this would look something like this, where it changes direction one, two, three times, and the far left and the far right are both going up. But the question is, where exactly will uh, this be on the graph? Like, what are some points that we can put on here? Well, we can find the y-intercept, first of all. So the y-intercept, we can find that by plugging a 0 in place of x and then solving for y. So if you plug a 0 in for x, we'd have 0 to the fourth power minus 3 times 0 cubed, which would give you 0 minus 0, which would be 0. So we have that point. We can also find the x-intercept. The x-intercepts we find by setting y equal to 0, which is your f of x. So set um, f of x equal to 0, and then solve for x. So here, what we want to do is we want to factor first. We can pull an x cubed out, and you're left with x minus 3 in parentheses. So we know that either x cubed would equal 0, or x minus 3 would equal 0. That gives you x equals 0, and x equaling positive 3. So we have some points here. We have 0, 0 for the y-intercept x-intercept, 0, 0 is another point, um, it's the same thing, but we find it here as well. And then we also have 3, 0. Now looking here, okay, notice that x to the third power um, and x minus 3 is to the first power. Both of those have odd exponents, which means that at those points that we get from that, that the graph is going to go through and actually cross over those points. So here we see everything typed up, and here we have those two points. And it's really not quite enough to determine what's going to happen with this particular graph. So what we want to do is plug in some points to figure out what's happening more specifically. Because we know that uh, the far right is going to be going up like this, and the far left is going to be going up like this. But the question is, what's happening in the middle in between these two points? So let's plug in maybe a 1 for x and see what we get. So if we plug a 1 in for x, we have 1 to the fourth power minus 3 times 1 cubed. And that would give you 1 minus 3, which is negative 2. So that point is at 1, negative 2, which would be right here. And then if we plug in a 2 for x, so if x is 2, we would get 2 to the 4th power, which would be 16, minus 3 times 2 cubed. Uh, 2 cubed is 8, so 3 times 8 is 24. So 16 minus 24 would be negative 8. 
So if x is 2, y is negative 8. That's going to be way down here. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we know in between it's going to go something like this. And it's got to go come got to come back up like this. And if you wanted, you could um, on the far right and far left get another point to see like how steep it is. You don't really have to necessarily since we're just sketching this, but it's going to look something like that. So you notice that um, there's only it's only changing direction one time down here, and that's fine because with an exponent of four, okay, it doesn't have to look like the, the graph I did. It doesn't have to look like this. Okay, it can look like that, and many times it will have the three different turns, but it can have at most three turns, but it can have less than that. So here it does kind of do something a little weird. It like does this little curvy thing. Um, so it does move a little bit, but it's not a, a change in direction necessarily. Now to finish off this lesson, let's take a look at cubic and quartic regression. So in the past we've learned about linear and quadratic regression. And here we're, we're expanding our knowledge to include something to the third power and something to the fourth power. All right, so here we are told that the data in this table gives the average speed, y, in knots of the Trident motor yacht for several different engine speeds, x, which is in hundreds of revolutions per minute, or RPMs. And we are to estimate the average speed of the Trident for an engine speed of 2400 RPMs. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this information, take this table, and we're going to put it into Microsoft Excel. And you can use other programs or software to perform the same things, but what we're choosing to use is my So here we are within Microsoft Excel, and we have our table put in here. So what we do is we can highlight the table, we can insert, press chart, press scatter plot, and here we have all those points graphed. And what we can do from here is we can create a trend line. So click trend line right here. And then we can click on the trend line. Right now it's a linear equation. It's a linear as, as a line that we have. You can right click, click format trend line. And then within here we can click on polynomial. So we can change it from degree of two, which would be something to the second power, and we change it to something to the third power or fourth power. And even here within Excel, we can do fifth or sixth power. All right, so looking here at the third power, uh, we can display the equation on the chart and then display the R squared value. Let's make this a little bit bigger. So here we have an equation that represents the data. And notice that our correlation of determination, our R squared value, is 0.9994, which is very close to 1. All right, now uh, notice if we click over here, we change the order or the degree to 4. Notice we have a new equation, and R squared is 0.9999, which means that this is better representing the data because it's closer to 1. All right, so we can use either equation um, to then try to predict what it's going to be if that engine has RPMs of 2400. All right, so let's go back to the, the cubic one. So the cubic one was right here. So here is the cubic equation. And so let's go back to our, our slide, our PowerPoint slide, and we'll, we'll discuss how to use this equation right here. So here we are back within PowerPoint and we have our graph, we have our equation, and the original question was asking to estimate the average speed of the Trident for an engine speed of 2400 RPMs. All right, so 2400, okay, that is your engine speed, that is your X value. And notice that our, our column, our X column, each number is in hundreds of revolutions per minute. So the 9 is 900, 11 is 1100. So what we need is actually to plug in 24 in place of x. All right, so x would be 24. We plug that in for x, and then we determine what is our y value. So if we plug it into this equation, we're going to have all of this. So 0.0048 times 24 to the third power. 
and then minus 0.1943 times 24 to the second power, plus 3.1318 times 24, minus 9.53. And if you calculate all of that correctly, you're going to get a y value of 19.51. So what that means is that when the RPM is 2400, then the boat speed is going to be at approximately 19.5 knots, which was the units for the boat speed. All right, so once you have your equation like that, you just plug it in, plug in the number you want, and then figure out your other value. And in this case, we found it to be 19.5. And that concludes our lesson for today. We will see you next time.